Welcome to video 7.3, Measuring Empathy Changes. If you need to look at your textbook, then it's pages 116 to 121 that you need to look at. Learning objectives for today are firstly to understand that entropy change represented by delta H is the heat energy change measured under conditions of constant pressure. Secondly, to know that standard entropy changes refer to standard conditions, i.e. 100 kilopascals in the stated temperature, so for example, delta H at 298. Be able to recall the definition of standard entropies of combustion and formation, and be able to calculate the entropy change from the heat change in the reaction using the equation Q equals MC delta T. So the first thing you need to know is that entropy is a measure of the heat content of a substance at constant pressure, and you need to be aware that you can't measure this directly. So if I wanted to know the entropy of methane, for example, I can't measure it directly. The only way you can calculate it is by measuring changes in entropy at constant pressure. And we'll get on to later about how you can tell the entropy of a substance using more complicated calculations. However, for now, all you need to worry about is the fact that you can measure a change in entropy, but this is done at constant pressure. Entropy change is represented by delta H, where delta is that um, triangle, which is a Greek letter. And delta H is the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. And we've met that before in the previous video, so you should be aware of it. So standard entropy changes. The word standard implies standard conditions. So an entropy change will depend on the conditions the reaction happens in. So things like temperature, pressure, and concentration have an effect on the entropy change. So in order to get around this, we talk about standard entropy changes using standard conditions. So standard entropy changes involve a pressure of 100 kilopascals or one atmosphere, a stated temperature, which is normally we use 25 degrees C or 298 degrees Kelvin, is normally used. If we have aqueous solutions involved in the reaction, then a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed would normally be used. And alongside this, the substances that you would be using in this reaction would be in their standard state, which means that they would be in their normal physical state under standard conditions. So there are two types of standard entropy changes that you need to know the different definitions for. One is combustion, which is a term you'll have heard before, which is just a scientific word for reacting with oxygen or for burning. So combustion is reaction with oxygen that's a case that you need to know about. The second example of entropy change you need to know about is formation. So the entropy of formation of a compound is how much energy changes when you form a compound from its elements. So if you're talking about an element rather than a compound, then the, form, the entropy of formation is always going to be zero for an element because the entropy of formation is how much energy is needed to get from the elements of the compound. If it's an element, there's no energy because it's already in its elemental state. So in order to measure entropy changes, we need to measure heat transfer. And heat transfer, you may be aware from your physics, and certainly you should have done this at UCC Chemistry, the heat transfer depends upon three things. It depends upon the mass of the substance that's being heated or cooled. It also depends on the temperature change, and it depends on the specific heat capacity of the substance that's being heated or cooled. So when we do calorimetry experiments, calorimetry is just experiments involving heat changes. So this diagram shows a typical, simple calorimeter that you might use in a sixth form lab. You have two polystyrene cups that have the reactants in. You have a thermometer to measure the temperature change. You have a glass stirrer so that you can stir the chemicals so they mix evenly and the temperature is distributed evenly. And you have, in this case, you've got a cork stopper, so a lid helps to have, helps to minimize heat loss. And this is an equation you should have met at GCSE. So heat change is calculated using Q equals MC delta T. So Q is our heat change in joules, which is what we're trying to measure. M is our mass, and it says volume in brackets, because when we're doing these calculations, quite often it's, it's water that we're using, and we, therefore the density of water is one gram per decimeter cubed. So the mass of the liquid is going to be the same as the volume. In most cases, we'll make this assumption even if it's an aqueous solution. However, if, if 
you're not supposed to make this assumption. They will give you the specific heat capacity of the solution that you're using. C is a specific heat capacity of the water, which is 4.18. You don't need to remember this. You will be told it in an exam. Delta T is the change in temperature. So you've got all the things that you need there. The one to be careful about is the mass. So when you've got the mass in that equation, that is the mass of the substance that is changing temperature. Now in most cases that you meet, that will be water. But students do get confused in exam questions. So for example, if you were combusting a fuel and it asked you to work out the heat change, then students would quite often put in the mass, the mass of the fuel that's been burned, rather than the mass of the water that's been heated up by the alcohol or fuel being burned. So you have to be careful there that it's the mass of the substance that's being changed in temperature. So once we've calculated our heat change, you quite often be asked to convert that into an enthalpy change. And there's a series of very simple steps that you need to go through here. So the first one is what we've just talked about on the previous slide, is to use Q equals MC delta T. Now be careful here that if you mix in two solutions, so if you had a neutralization reaction, for example, and you had two solutions which were being mixed, you'd have to remember that it's a total volume of the mixture because once you've mixed, say, the acid and the alkali together, the whole solution is going to be heated, not just one of them. So be careful with that. Otherwise, it's just as described on the previous slide. So once you've worked out Q, you then need to work out the number of moles of the substance in the question. So if you had a solid, then you would use number of moles equals mass divided by MR. If you had a solution, then you'd have to use number of moles equals Molality times by volume, remembering to divide by a thousand if your volume is in centimeters cubed. Once you've worked out the number of moles, you then divide Q, which is in joules, by the number of moles, and this gives joules per mole. Of course, our enthalpy changes, we need to convert to kilojoules per mole. So, to get to this, to get from joules per mole to kilojoules per mole, we just divide by a thousand. And then we need to either give delta H a negative or a positive sign, remembering if we had a temperature rise and that's an exothermic reaction, so delta H is negative, if it's an endothermic, so temperature has gone down, then it would be a positive sign. So you need to know about the errors in calorimetry. So the main sources of error, the biggest source of error is energy loss to the surroundings, so you've got heat loss. And that should be your number one answer in an exam question if they ask you about sources of error in calorimetry is heat loss to the surroundings. The second problem is that although we, we calculate the energy using the specific heat capacity of the water, we ignore the fact that the vessel that's, that's containing the solution is being heated itself. So we're ignoring the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter which is going to lead to errors. There's also quantitative errors associated with measurements, so you may measure things incorrectly. Things we can do to improve this, which is a common exam question, to overcome the heat loss, the main thing you could do is you could lag the calorimeter, so you could put insulation around it so that you lose less heat to the surroundings. You could place a lid on the apparatus if there isn't one already. You could include the heat transfer to the apparatus, so you could take account of the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter. And to get over those quantitative errors, you can use more accurate apparatus. The other thing that we need to consider is the assumptions we've made in order to do these calculations. And for this, we've assumed the substances we're using are 100% pure. We've assumed the concentrations of solutions are accurate. And we've also assumed the reactions instantaneous and go to completion. The last thing we need to talk about is cooling curves and allowing for heat loss. So when we measure our temperature of a reaction, the temperature we measure is not an accurate measure of the true temperature, and this is down to heat loss. But we can make some allowances for this by plotting a graph of the temperature and then extrapolating it to the time of the two chemicals mixed. This sounds complicated, but it's actually quite straightforward. It's easier if I show you a graphic example. So here's a typical plot that you would have. On the x-axis you've got time, and on the y-axis you've got temperature. So what you would do is, if you say you had two chemicals that you're going to mix for a reaction, 
you would take a measurement of the temperature before you mix them. So you can see there we've taken, if you look at that horizontal line before the gap, we've taken four measurements. So we've taken a measurement at one, two, three, and four minutes. And you can see there's a slight variation in that temperature. So we've measured the temperature for four minutes. We've then had a gap. So at the fifth minute, we've not taken a temperature. And that's the, temp the time sorry, at which we've mixed it. So at the moment that you mix the two chemicals, you don't take a temperature. So you take it for four, three or four minutes beforehand. You take it for a minute after you've measured, after you've mixed the chemicals, and then each minute after that. But you don't take a temperature at the time where you actually mix the chemicals. So this gives us this funny looking graph here where you've got a line that's almost horizontal and then after you've mixed it you can see the temperature goes up slightly and then it starts going down again. So what we can do on the next slide I can show you, we're going to extrapolate the temperature to see what it would be at the time that we mix the chemicals. So this dotted line here shows an extrapolation of the line. So you have to do a line of best fit for this. So if you extrapolated that um, bottom line, the horizontal one, before you mix the reactions, you'd also have to do it for that. If you extrapolate that to five minutes, you can see that you would have about 22 degrees C there. So our starting temperature would be 22 degrees C. To find out our final temperature, you just follow that dotted line back to the time at which we mixed it, which was five minutes. And that would give us the temperature. So you can see there, that would give us a temperature of about 80 degrees C. So our temperature change then our delta H would be 80 minus 22. So that gives us a more accurate temperature change because we're allowing for the fact that we've got heat loss. So the last thing to do is just do these definitions. So standard molar enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change from one mole of the compound is formed from its constituent elements under standard conditions, all reactants and products in their standard states. The standard molar enthalpy of combustion is the enthalpy change when one mole of compound is completely burned in oxygen under standard conditions, all reactants and products in their standard states. It's important that you memorise and learn these word for word so that you get them exactly right in an exam situation. So lastly, here are the learning objectives again. As usual, if you don't understand them, go back, watch the video, read the textbook, do whatever you have to do to make sure that you know this before you come into lesson. So our le learning objectives were to understand that enthalpy change is a heat energy change measured under conditions of constant pressure, know that standard enthalpy changes refer to standard conditions, be able to recall the definition of standard enthalpy of combustion and formation, and be able to calculate the enthalpy change from the heat change in a reaction using the equation Q equals MC delta T.